toadfish. At least two things in common, our middle ear and experience in outer space. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. In Native American lore and myth, animals and other creatures are often referred to as our brothers and sisters. It's always seemed kind of a quaint notion that we humans are somehow closely related to other living creatures on this planet. But the early Native Americans were on to something. The double helix tells us that this is more than just a nice idea. Those now famous double strands tie all living things together. Four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of this thing. In 1998, the shuttle Discovery headed into orbit with the unique passenger. Former astronaut and Senator John Glenn was returning to space after 36 years. It wasn't sentimentality that put him in orbit. His flight was an opportunity to study the effects of space flight on older human bodies. But humans in space are relatively common. Toadfish in space are not. It happens that Glenn's unusual traveling companions have inner ears virtually identical to ours. The inner ear is essential to balance and spatial orientation. So by studying the effects of weightlessness on toadfish, you can get a pretty good idea of what the effects would be on humans. Steve Heistein specializes in toadfish inner ears. Obviously evolution has changed human beings as we evolve from the fishes. But the point is that the balance and equilibrium system hasn't changed. That this fish senses his orientation in space and his balance when he moves around in a very identical fashion to the way that we do. So we call that a highly evolved system. That means it was perfected when it first appeared in the bony fishes several hundred million years ago. It turns out that toadfish aren't the only sea creatures with similarities to humans. The Marine Biological Laboratory, known as the MBL, conducts biomedical research on marine life of all kinds. So we've got to go to another, another set of DNA fingerprints, another, another loci to try and sort out these ones. Roger Hanlon's special interest is squid. Squid are about as unlike human beings as they could be, yet they are absolutely essential to the study of human neuroscience. They have the largest nerve cells on planet Earth. Squids are different from human beings, but when you get down to the level of the individual nerve fiber, the differences are negligible. And so you can study a nerve cell in a squid and you can learn fundamental processes and mechanisms of how our nerve cells work. We are definitely more like squid and snails than we like to believe. It's just a fact of life. Using animal models for human research is nothing new. Mice are invariably on the cutting edge of genetic and medical science, in large part because they're mammals, like us. The MBL, on the other hand, studies sea creatures exclusively. What do you have here? Uh, just sex and fungus. The lab's aquaria support nearly a hundred different marine species. As different as they are from mammals, each has something to offer human medicine. The simple vision system of these horseshoe crabs evolved 300 million years ago. And you can see these horseshoe crabs right here. This is a marvelous eye that has been the subject of a Nobel Prize about how vision works. And so this simple eye is easy to get to, easy to study, but the fundamental mechanism is the same as this eye right here. Skate eyes have a specialized retina, so scientists here are looking into the eyes of skates, looking for cures for the inherited human eye disease, retinitis pigmentosa. Clams are used to study cancer. Their cells divide the same way ours do. Fish can regrow their nerves and restore nerve function. That's something we can't do, but would like to. The oceans are a good place to look because life in the oceans greatly preceded life on land. And so you have highly conserved, highly successful organisms and systems that have been forged by evolution. So you can 
find a lot of the comparisons across taxa that are applicable to us. Take the case of the cone snail very carefully. This is a tropical marine snail and I have to handle it very carefully because it's venomous. It has an enzyme that is involved in the production of the venom that is an analog of what human beings also carry. The same enzyme does different things in each species. In humans, it's used to build bones and clot blood. In cone snails, it's used to synthesize venom, which they inject with this barb. The interesting thing is, the gene that makes a cone snail's enzyme has a much shorter sequence than the one in humans. So that gives us an idea of what parts of the sequence have been conserved throughout evolution and what parts are important for the function of this enzyme. That may teach us something about the vertebrate enzyme, which might be important to understand when you have dysfunctions of this enzyme, which will lead to blood disorders and things like that. This tank could be in a pet shop. Zebrafish are often aquarium pets. What are they doing here? Well, in the early stages of development, human and fish embryos behave identically. But in human pregnancy, all the activity happens out of sight. With zebrafish, on the other hand, it's in plain view and relatively easy to study. If you want to study how the nervous system develops, or the brain, or the spinal cord in particular, this is a fish you can study it in because it has clear eggs. You can study all the early development, and you cannot do that in a higher vertebrate like us because it's all inside. So this unusual little fish that's found in many pet stores is all the rage in biomedical circles and is being used throughout this country and others as a study of human medicine. The bottom line is that knowing the genetic sequence of cone snails and zebra fish and human beings, we're beginning to understand not only the systems we have in common, but that under the fins and shells and skin, we're all related. Genetics has definitely clinched the unity of life. We all have genes, we know we come from genes, we know we're formed by genes and the environment of course, but I think the idea of the genetic commonness of all organisms on earth really hits home right at the heart of the entire matter. Well, I love seafood as much as anyone does. I do eat my experimental subjects and I don't have any qualms about doing that. But we learn a lot from them and I guess from our perspective we gain a lot of respect for the complexity of nature and what we can learn from it. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.